my name is Chelsea O'Brien. I'm one of the assistant curators here at ACME. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of the land on which we are gathered, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to ACME Conversations Empathy Machines. Tonight we'll be interrogating the ethics, assumptions and privileges associated with technological storytelling. This is actually our final um, season of the ACME Conversations. We will be returning in September. And I should take this opportunity to mention, um, if you need more VR in your life, which I'm sure we all do, we're here, um, we have just opened Sean Glad's, Gladwell's Storm Riders in our VR lounge. The documentary explores feed, freedom, faith and feminism through the context of skateboarding and includes a restaging of Gladwell's storm sequence from 2000. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome our host tonight, Santilla Chingaipe. She's an award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker. She spent nearly a decade working for SBS World News, which saw her report from across Africa and interview some of the continent's most prominent leaders. Her work explores cultural identities, contemporary migration and politics. Last year, she presented a one-off documentary for SBS, Date My Race. Santilla is cu currently directing and writing document a documentary on the comp complexities of, the, of Australia's South Sudanese community. Her latest film, Black As Me, is a short documentary exploring the perception of beauty and race in Australia. She regularly writes for the Saturday paper. So before we start, a few housekeeping rules. We do, of course, regret that one of our speakers couldn't make it this evening. Um, and excitingly, there will be a Q&A after the session. This session is being live streamed, so I do ask that you wait for the microphone. If you do need to leave at any time, the door is just down over to my left as you entered through. Um, what am I saying? That's all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think it's going to be a fantastic session. And if you could please give a round of applause for our fantastic panel. Um, thanks for that introduction, Chelsea. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, I would like to introduce tonight's panellists. And right next to me is Dr. Fincina Hopgood, and she's a lecturer in screen studies at the University of New England, where she teaches the unit's Australian screens and human rights on screen. Her interest in empathy stems from her research expertise investigating portrayals of mental illness and suicide in film and television. And next to Fincina is Amina Nassim, and Amina is an artist from the Maldives living on Wurundjeri land. She makes games and interactive work for public play. She's one of the founders of Wood Copenhagen Play Festival, and she also works in the collective's Play React Reactive and Copenhagen Games Collective. And at the very end is Brett Levy, and Brett calls himself a vir virtual heritage Jedi. <laughs> A descendant of the Kuma people of Western Queensland, Brett has spent his career dedicated to seeking innovative ways to preserve and present Indigenous arts, language and culture using new technologies. Can you please make the panellists feel very welcome? <laughs> so I will explain how tonight's going to work. So each of the panellists is going to give a presentation which will last for about 10 minutes or so and we'll have a quick chat about it and then we'll launch into some of the themes of tonight's talk um, and to lead us into the presentations is Fincina she's gonna kickstart everything thanks so much Santilla <laughs> and thanks everyone for coming out tonight particularly given such a cold Melbourne winter evening and I do hope we can have a fantastically heartwarming conversation about empathy and screen technology um, I think I should begin by giving a, a little bit of a context for my interest in empathy as an emotion. Um, I'm not actually a person who researches virtual reality in, in my screen studies work, so I'm really interested to learn more about virtual reality in our discussion this evening. But empathy is really at the heart of any, everything that I've done as a screen studies researcher. So to give you a little bit of background, um, for some time now I've been looking at how mental illness and suicide are portrayed in film and television. 
And in the course of that research, I've become really interested in what happens when screen storytellers invite an audience or a viewer to empathise with a character who is being treated as mentally unwell or given a mental illness diagnosis. And I really wanted to interrogate what that emotion of empathy might feel like or might look like or how it might be conveyed to the audience. So really, that's the background for me being here tonight. It's sort of um, interesting for me to think about virtual reality as an extension of my research in screen studies. And at the end of the day, I really want us to all be thinking about storytelling and the ways in which we can use different technologies for storytelling. So that's my little preamble. I also wanted to thank the organisations up there because for many years I've been doing research around empathy supported by this fantastic organisation, the Centre for the History of Emotions. I'd like to put a shout out to them um, and they've been really fabulous at supporting my research and of course uh, UNE are very much part of my life. So this sounds really basic but I think it's worth orienting our discussion tonight around just what is empathy. And as anyone who knows, who's done any reading about empathy, there's an absolute plethora of definitions, gifts, pictures, ways of understanding the distinctions between empathy and sympathy, feeling for someone versus feeling with someone. So I really wanted to just pick out a few of the key, I guess, ideas around empathy that I think can help to anchor our discussion tonight. First of all, I want you to be thinking about empathy as an act of imagination. I think that's really important that we remember that our imagination is what's being fired when we have an empathic response or an empathetic reaction to something or to someone. And often we hear about the definition of empathy being distinguished from feeling for somebody. That's sympathy, that's pity. Feeling with someone. And this idea of feeling with is about sharing emotions and sharing perspective. So when we talk about screen technologies, whether that be documentaries, games, or virtual reality, I want you to think about how is it that these technologies are encouraging us to share emotions and perspective. Now, often when you read about empathy, it's written about in terms of metaphor. And I think these metaphors are really interesting because they come back to the body and they come back to the senses. And virtual reality is all about engaging that sense of embodiment in a storytelling space. So these metaphors of seeing the world through another's eyes or walking in my shoes are very much the kind of metaphors that I think the technology is asking us to engage with. And as I've found over the years exploring empathy, the research is vast. It's intimidating, it's fascinating, but it's just all-encompassing. And many of you will have come across empathy research in different contexts, in different fields. Of course, the wave of interest in empathy has been very much fired by neuroscience and the discovery of mirror neurons. And you've probably heard about this, and this idea that there's a neurological basis for empathy, the idea that we all have it in our brains, this innate capacity for empathy. But people like to interrogate, well, what happens when that capacity is somehow damaged, or how can that capacity be further nurtured or encouraged through education, through storytelling, through art, etc. So that's kind of just mapping the field in a very quick tour, I suppose, but I hope it can help give us a common language or a common vocabulary for this idea of empathy machines. And that's the most texty slide you'll see tonight. <laughs> Sorry about the text. Um, I've put up a couple of works here that I think are really interesting as examples of the explosion of research and interest in empathy over the last decade in across a whole range of fields. As I mentioned, it traverses philosophy, neuroscience, the creative arts, etc. I've singled out these works uh, for our discussion tonight, not because I want to talk about the works per se, but I wanted to just anchor the discussion of empathy around social change, around questions of ethics, and around questions of relationships with the world and animals. So in all of those books, there's very much an interrogation of what happens when we have an empathic experience. What changes in ourselves? Does this actually lead to social change? Or, as is often theorised, is empathy overwhelming? Can empathy actually stop us from acting because it becomes emotionally overwhelming? And there's a lot of interrogation about this idea that sometimes too much emotion is actually not a good thing for action and that there needs to be a balance between emotion and action. Um, one particular work that I think is really interesting for us in terms of screen storytelling is the work there by Robert Sinnebrink. He's an Australian scholar at Macquarie University. And he's got a really interesting idea that the kind of empathy we experience through screen storytelling is not the same as the empathy that we experience in real life. It's a particular type of empathy. He calls it sin empathy, as in a play on cinema. But he says that still has a social value because it has an ethical component to it. And I think that's really interesting to think about, OK, what's different between empathising with a person right in front of me and empathising with a character on a screen, or indeed empathising in a virtual reality context? So we might have a more nuanced engagement with empathy. 
For me, in terms of my research, obviously empathy and screen media are absolutely crucial to understanding ways in which we can tell stories about mental health, ways that are more responsible, more accurate, more empathetic and more sensitive to people with lived experience. The image that you have there is from an, an event which, funnily enough, we called Try Walking in My Shoes, uh, which we organised at the University of Melbourne, in which we brought together a whole bunch of people who have an interest in the question of using screen media, whether that be documentaries, short films, feature films, using screen media to tell stories about mental health. And what we were really interested in is the positive potential of screen media. We hear a lot about the negative potential of screen media. We heard it most recently in relation to 13 Reasons Why. There's a lot of concerns about the damage that screen stories about mental health can do. But we wanted to look at what are the positives that screen media can bring to the stories about mental health. And the emotion of empathy, as you know, gives us a chance to really see how things are with another person, to see their stories or to see their perspective. And we do think that empathy is absolutely crucial to combating the stigma against mental illness and particularly to opening up conversations about mental health and indeed to challenging stereotypes. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of the current landscape in relation to screen stories about mental health. Um, this is picking up on the discussion last week for anyone who was here for the ACME Conversations diversity panel. We had a fantastic discussion last week about the importance of seeing ourselves on screen and seeing diverse stories of Australian culture and life. Um, and so that statistic there is just kind of referencing that discussion we had last week about the importance of the authenticity of representations of people living with mental health issues and the importance of the voice and having someone in the writer's room who has that lived experience informing the creation of those stories. In particular, I wanted to highlight the work that's being done in the sphere with the organisation uh, called Mindframe for Stage and Screen. Now, Mindframe Frame for Stage and Screen, it's actually a partnership between the Australian Writers Guild, SANE Australia, the mental health charity, and Every Mind, a mental health organisation based in Newcastle. And this program's been running now for over a decade, and it offers a whole range of resources, advice, tools, and advocacy for script writers who are exploring writing stories about mental health and suicide. So it gives them access not only to research information and expert advice, but to people with lived experience. The idea being that if there isn't someone in the writer's room who's got access to that lived experience, you need to get that access, you need to get that insight. And that is the way to create empathetic storytelling. I've included, of course, there a wonderful image from Please Like Me as an example of how we can embed empathetic storytelling around mental health and the characters of Rose and Hannah being great examples of the fact that there can be more than one story about mental health in, in a show. And I think that's something we looked at last week too, this idea that diversity in screen representations is going beyond tokenism, beyond having the one story about someone with a mental health problem or a disability, having multiple stories. And I think that's really important. And obviously ABC's Mental As is a key example of that as well. I thought to embed this uh, discussion further in an international context, it's worth being aware of the fact that while there's some really great work being done in the Australian context, it's actually part of a broader international wave of what I would, would be calling mental health screen culture. In other words, using screen media to actually develop and support conversations around mental health. These are some organisations based in Canada and the US who are all doing fantastic work with screen technology. In particular, I think what's important about the work these organisations are doing is they're embedding the lived experience and people's stories of mental health issues and suicide in the films that they're screening. And these aren't just documentaries and feature films, these are often short films produced by people with lived experience. In particular, Art with Impact is an organisation that partners with people who have a lived experience of mental illness and suicide and supports them to pick up a camera to tell their story and then what they do with those stories is they take them on tours around colleges and universities and actually show people their stories. And in the showing of the stories, that's like the first act. Then the second act is the conversation that follows. And then the third act, the final act, if you like, is the connection to resources and expert information. So as an example there, I've put it there on the slide, Movies for Mental Health, you can see they've embedded it around food, short films, discussion and resources. And I think that's really important for us to think about the context in which we share screen stories about mental illness and suicide and to think about how important context is for building empathy and creating a sense of community. 
Oh, also, I forgot to mention the Rendezvous with Madness Film Festival. That's in Toronto, and that's been running for 25 years now. And I think it's a fantastic example of how you can have a rich, diverse film culture that explores a whole range of mental health issues in a supportive environment. And Frames of Mind is another example that's running out of the Pacific Cinematheque, like the Vancouver equivalent of ACME, in fact. And they've been running for 15 years in partnership with the university's uh, psychiatry department. So I now want to focus on how we move the discussion further along from going beyond research and going beyond having that sense of collaboration between the mental health sector and the screen industry. I want to finish by focusing on giving the tools for screen technology to the people who can tell their own stories. And I think we're living in a really exciting time where that screen technology is more accessible than ever, obviously through smartphones and tablets, etc. But within this particular space, um, we are seeing fabulous collaborations between people from marginalised communities. I'm not just using that term to refer to people from um, the mental health sector, but also people from cultural and linguistically diverse communities, collaborating with organisations such as Curious Works, which is based in Sydney and Melbourne. And they actually help develop capacity around storytelling, give access to technology, and help to expand the range of representations that we see on our screens. So I think we're in a really interesting space now where because we've got the technology that we can put it in people's hands and say, OK, you want to tell your story? Here's a smartphone. This is what you need to know. We really do have the potential to tap into screen media for empathy. And just to finish on that, there's a wonderful quote here from one of the people who was supported to tell her own mental health story by Art With Impact. I never could have imagined that telling my story could have an impact on someone. And I think the key thing to remember here is that storytelling is about making connection, building communities, and helping to combat stigma and uh, discrimination. And I really do um, think it's an exciting time for us to reflect upon just what are the positive potentials of screen media for mental health and building on that how we can have other screen technologies like games and virtual reality to help build a culture of empathy. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Lena. Um, I have a few questions. First of all, I, l I like your definition about empathy being an act of imagination. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a, that's a wonderful way of um, framing tonight's conversation. But I'm curious to know why the focus on mental illness on, on screen, like why was that important for you to look at? It's so interesting when you think about how did I end up here? <laughs> it began in my own research. I've always been a fas fascinated by the Australian screen industry, by film and television. That's been my passion for a long time. And as often happens when you're be beginning that research journey, you're thinking about what's a bunch of films that I would want to live with for five or six years, because that's really what a PhD is going to take. Um, and without intending to do so, I found that the films I was gravitating towards and the films I was most interested in from a particular period in the 90s all were engaging with mental health issues in different ways. Um, so I was interested in looking at films like Shine, Angel Baby, Cozzy, An Angel at My Table. And I didn't set out to kind of look for mental health films, but I just suddenly went, hang on, this is really interesting. They have something in, in common here. Um, and I then went further and thought, well, what, what am I, what's my interest as a screen studies researcher? And it, my interest was there wasn't much happening at this time. This was in the early 2000s. There really wasn't much happening about how can we use screen media to tell stories about mental health. At that point, the only literature I could find was written by people from a mental health professional perspective who understandably were very concerned that many of the stories in the films that we were seeing were unfairly stigmatising people with mental illness, uh, were misrepresenting what it is to live with the condition, uh, were creating more damage and contributing to stigma. So everything I could find was basically saying, you know, films about mental illness are unhelpful, they're stigmatising. And I was looking at these Australian films and thinking, well, I think they might be doing something a little different. And I think they might be giving us an opportunity to actually emotionally engage with a character, such as Janet Frame, for example, in An Angel at My Table, or indeed David Helfgott in Shine, or the couple in Angel Baby. And these are the protagonists of these stories. These are the heroes and the heroines of these stories. Um, and to simply dismiss them out of hand as being stigmatising or inaccurate kind of is misunderstanding what the appeal of these stories are. And we can't ignore the fact that, you know, particularly a film like Shine had a huge, a huge commercial response mm. internationally as well as locally. So it really began my journey there of thinking, can we use screen media in a more positive, constructive, empathetic way mm. to share stories about mental health? And whatever reservations or criticisms people might have of those films, I still think they were the beginning 
of a conversation that we've continued to have since then about how do we tell these stories in ways that are insightful, helpful, but also at the end of the day, we have to deal with the fact that we're dealing with a commercial industry yeah. and there's constraints around those commercial industries yeah. in particular. And so how do you use genre? How do you use emotion? How do you use music yeah. to bring the audience along on that journey? Well, that was going to be my follow-up question mm. because I, you talked about how the importance of embedding people in writers' rooms that mm. have experiences to, to create a level of authenticity. Um, but I wonder, where do you draw the balance between um, having that authenticity but also allowing the art to kind of you know, uh, yeah. manifest itself? I mean, how do you allow writers to um, get the characters to express themselves as they imagine in their own minds? Um, how do you strike that balance? Because I, 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 would, I, I think it's a very challenging one, just from a it is challenging. perspective. And I think you have to remember that in the writer's room, you're not making a documentary, you are making a story. Mm. And those stories will be, you know, under certain parameters around genre, around viewing context, around the commercial interests, etc., of the network you're writing for, for example. So it's always going to be a trade-off. There's going to be a point of tension, I think, between commercial imperatives and ethical obligations. But I think that's really where um, the Mind Frame for Stage and Screen initiative, which has been going now, as I said, for 10 years, is actually a world leader in terms of its collaboration between the mental health community and the screen industry, because it's about developing storytelling techniques that are still imaginative, are still captivating and still engaging, but don't resort to tired old cliches of the mad genius or the psycho killer or any of those other you know, stereotypes that you can think of. Yeah. Um, and I always come back to the fact that if you're a writer of screen stories, it gives you an opportunity to actually be more creative and do something new and something bold and something daring that hasn't been done before. If you are willing to take the time to do the research, to engage with the lived experience and then come up with a new way of telling that story that hasn't been seen before. Okay. And I think we saw that with Please Like Me. I mean, yeah. that was a great example of using comedy as a way of telling these stories in an authentic way. Okay. I could ask you a couple more questions, but we do have mm. um, others that we need to hear from. Of and course. from screen to video games, Amani. So first of all, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. So, so I make games and play things, and I also work making different types of events where you can go and play games. and. Um, for a long time, I've just been really concerned with just putting playthings everywhere in fest and making festivals, putting games in nightclubs, and just trying to figure out where I can put games and where I can make people play. And I do it together with different people. Um, I'm really concerned with like how we play together and how we get to come across these objects that we're making. Um, so I work with the, these two uh, collectives right now, Play Reactive and Copenhagen Game Collective. Play Reactive are, are in Melbourne and they make um, a lot of different interactive um, artworks, theater, and a set of exciting things to come. And uh, Copenhagen Game Collective is in Denmark and I've been working with them before I came here and I carry on working with them now as well. Um, this is a play festival that I made in Copenhagen um, together with the Copenhagen um, Game Collective and, and a, a production company called Ingrib. And um, we made this because we wanted an opportunity to try and run these games that uh, you play on the streets and in public um, en environments. And you need a lot of people to play together with you, so we kind of had to make a festival. And also we wanted to start conversations with people, other people who are doing this kind of thing. So in, we invited people internationally to come and talk with us and try and explore this space of public play. This is one of the games that I, that I made. I like to put people in kind of awkward situations. So this is a dance, dance game, a little video. There are magnets on these move controllers. 
and uh, it's like a kind of 3D dancing twister. So when the colors light up, you have to connect in the, at the right spots. And the more you dance, the more points you get. And there's a leaderboard on our screen there. This is at our festival in Copenhagen. You can imagine like this game changes depending on where you play it and who's playing it quite a bit. So when we were running this in uh, Roskilde Festival, which is one of the biggest games, uh, music festivals in the Nordic region, there, were, there would be drunk people coming and challenging each other and getting into all kinds of positions. Okay, so next slide. This is a project that I did for uh, the Venice Finale in 2013. Um, this is where I'm from. I'm from the Maldives, and this is my island, Mali. It's two and a half square kilometers, and about 200,000 200, people live there. Um, just before we went, there was a, a military coup, and a lot of uh, violence was happening on the streets, mostly from police towards pro uh, people who were protesting, because it was just after the coup, and... Um, people wanted to, we all wanted to have proper elections. So this was, so when we went there, so this is, okay, this is, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Maldives. Um, this is uh, the first democratically elected president of the Maldives. He was elected in 2008. And uh, he made an underwater cabinet meeting it was an actual cabinet meeting and it happened underwater because we are one of the places in the world that are really threatened by climate change. So I think this was a really great humorous way of getting people's attention. And this is Mali, this is where we went to play. We were nine artists and designers um, from different parts of the world, mostly from Europe and uh, America. So we had been involved in making play and events in in different capacities and different collectives. And I'm really thankful for these people to, uh, because they came to the Maldives to make games with us and talk to people. Um, they made, we, we all together made, made nine games. We tried to understand what was going on there and see where we could play. Sometimes, because it was so crowded, we had to play in the water. We had a game played um, different media involving a week long it, it was really tricky because because at that time when we went, if, if you were more than three people together outside, you could get arrested. So we had a lot of interesting conversations and we were worried about what kind of situation we we're putting people in as well. This is um, a game that I made while we were there. Sorry about the bad screen quality. It's just a, I think I did it with the um, computer camera. So it was it was really hot in in the Maldives, and, we, and also there was no space to play, so we ended up um, playing in the water. So I guess that's a little about me. Thanks, Mani. Um, I learned a lot from that. I actually had no idea what public play was a was a big thing um what not really what, what, it seems because like it's, it's very a, little public space as well right so what was your interest like how did you get into it how did you find out about it um and what got you involved because you talked about why you think it's important for people to play together in in public and i just wanted you to elaborate on that a bit more um i got into making games because i would did a Masters of Digital, um, digital Design at, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and I got into that by accident because I just wanted to learn how to make flash animations so that I could do activism stuff. Um, and, um, and then I ended up getting this Masters and everything I ma made was like a be play between people. So then I was talking to more and more games people and 
And of course, this was a, um, I was working with uh, sensors and location and, and so going out and, and public space is a real concern for me because it's so problematic in the Maldives as well. Um, so yeah, and I, it, I just ended up um, finding the people who are, who are making the, that kind of play um, and trying to get people together to do that, yeah. yeah. How do you come up with the games? I mean, that magnetized me was pretty cool. And I was just trying to figure out how that concept came up. Like, you know, what was the thought process? And That was, um, I guess I'm really concerned with the way we move around with our bodies and, and how we meet each other. And, um, and, and also, I was really inspired by some of the kind of games that were being made around at that time as well, using these controllers. And it was giving us some new possibilities that easy to hack into. And some people had made an API that we could use. Um, uh, there's another game called Joust um, that was also made around there, and we were using it, we were using these ideas. We were inspired by that, and um, it was from a game jam. And I, I wanted to make a dancing game, <laughs> um, and and then. I, I don't know, we just had these magnets. I found out that there's a magnet in there. Yeah. So um, it just kind of developed together with the group that I was working with. Great. I do have a few more questions for you, but I'll hold off um, yeah. and I'll let Brett take it away. Want to jump up? Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Brett. I'm going to stand up because I've got a. I bring all my toys with me. Um, it's a just, uh, I'll just talk about what I do, just quickly. Um, I'm a Coomaramurri, firstly, where I'm from, Western Queensland. I'm an, I sometimes call myself a digital Aboriginal, and I like games. I like playing games. I used to be a very, very good paladin healer in World of Warcraft. I used to be called Blessed, and I was one of the best in the world. One other thing I want to say, actually, I'm going to say one other story. I'm going to embarrass my son. He's here in the back. <laughs> and I was playing Diablo, and I was connected online. And back then, I had to connect into the phone socket. And, and then I got tapped on the shoulder by my um, brother-in-law, who'd driven over and said, your wife's ringing you. Your son's being born. <laughs> <laughs> and that was him. <laughs> um, I do like games. <laughs> I do love my son too. <laughs> um, I'm going to put something up on the screen here. Um, it's going to come up in a minute. I want to make an Aboriginal game. I want to map the cultural heritage of Aboriginal Australia in three-dimensional space. I really want to make a time machine. I want to get people to empathise and walk in the footsteps of First Nations people. So uh, hence, I think, why I'm here to talk. Um, and I think there's something in that. I don't know if I want to answer the question of sovereignty, but I'm going to try. We've done a lot of projects. You're going to see a, a world premiere, if you don't mind. And if you could, if you've got a piece of paper, I would have asked you to give me some um, tips and feedback so we can be better. My team's, I'm not alone. I'm only the front fella, the front man. Um, and I'm trying to get my guys skilled up to be better at what we do. And doing that, um, they're getting better. I've got a couple of token white fellas in my team. Um, but the fellas I've got there, they like the little group we've got. They're, they're a bit damaged. They are. Um, and so uh, one guy I had who's older than me called Dorian. Dorian's father or great or parents or grandparents or ancestors were the first settlers of Brisbane. And they weren't nice people. And if you know anything about the history of a, of a place, in the settlement of Brisbane, the history of Brisbane, they used to shoot blacks and they got paid for it. Uh, you get 50 pounds a pelt or something like that. It's gazetted, it's discussed. Where it became a bit of an issue was that this guy 
um, not Doreen's relatives, but around that space, got cranky about the kids that he wouldn't be paid for. Um, and he said they were going to be recalcitrant, they would grow up to be recalcitrants, was the word, and therefore cause trouble. And hence you might hear about boundary streets in cities, boundary streets where blacks had to be across that place um, before sun went down. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to do that sort of game, but I want to do the romantic one first and sneak up on that sort of stuff. It's just comprehensive that I do this. Can that light come down on the screen, maybe? That one? This is Wimmera, the Wimmera River. So we did this with the uh, local people, Wadjabuk. Any Koori people here? Am I the only and following the back there? Yeah, that's all right. Wadjabuk, we're trying to re reflect on the stories of the local people along that river before first settlement. We've done 38 projects across the country. Brisbane, city, we're doing all regional towns, firstly. Um, we think that the regional towns and the rivers were very important and why, we, why you guys settled there in the first instance. But we were there for a little bit longer before that, I imagine. This stuff you're seeing here is topographically correct. Um, we take it from shuttle mission satellite data. Um, it's, the vegetation is based on soil maps. I build on the shoulders of giants. I think I want to say that these, all my speakers before me um, just resonate the why for why I do it. And I, and I don't, I love the way they articulate it. And trust me, this, this yarn's inspiring to me. It helps us to focus, rethink what we're doing, and work harder. And I, sincerely, I mean that. Um, games in, in Indigenous society, it's always been for us. You know, even the, this game that you guys might play called AFL, we invented it. <laughs> Mangrook, you heard that? Yeah. Well, we do play games and that's how we work. Um, this thing here is actually an immersive world. I said to you, I was going on about soil type. The soil type generates the vegetation type. Every tree you look in this is all different. And if you notice, you can navigate through it. So we made it um, 64 by 64 kilometres in size. There's 12 or 1,300 quests in this one, a tasks, the cultural tasks. You've got to survive. And um, in that survival, there's a little bit of a quest here. If you see at the top there, there's hard to read there, but it's saying to you, find the camp. In the other, uh, from where I'm looking at, the left-hand side, there's a GPS positioning system. I also have a babel fish in it, so I localise the language. And then I've got 3D characters and animals that all have an artificial intelligence. I've got one fella called Coriel, who's a Yorta Yorta fella, who's dealing with the AI for all the animals. Another guy who's, well, Dorian's doing the trees and making sure every tree is unique. Um, we've got bush food in it, bush medicine in it. If you get sick, you've got to find the right bush medicine. You've got to speak to your elders. I'm not saying this can heal our mob, but there's something about identity when you can walk on country. And I'm hoping that when we do this, it'll encourage our youth at least to then go back to country and know a bit more about country if they're using this. We invented Black Book, Facebook, Black Book, sorry. Uh, so we, we do use it. But I'm saying that there's something in this. And I'm not saying it's going to be the be all and end all, but it's something. And it's what I do, and it's fun, and it's engaging. I'll just move along a bit. It, obviously, it, you see the wind blowing. It's linked to the Bureau of Meteorology. So when it rains in the real world, it rains in the virtual. But people go, that might be incredible. Your phones do it. We're just, again, as I said, we're building on the shoulders of giants. Um, I can move around. Uh, every plant's metadata. And I can look here at this screen, so I don't have to look back up there. And I can jump up here, if I can, just move up here. And I'm going to walk along this path. Now, this is called virtual river yarns. There's a little um, go out, uh, what is it, an emu, I should call him. Um, he's going to run away from me. In the first instance, he's going to not be too bothered. But as I hunt him and eat him, he gets a bit cranky. Most animals do, and they'll flee more often than they than they'll um, in the later times, and they'll get a little bit faster too. Um, we have to craft your own weapons over time, so it's not a fast game. This is take your time to take your time, which is what my grandfather used to tell me to do, and I tend to run a bit too fast on occasions. 
Um, and I think if I do this or do that or do that, I can run. No, that might be crouch, I think, if I jump up. And yeah, there you go. I'm going to work out how to run. There you go. I'll run into camp here. There's a wombat there. Watch out. Um, if you run in the trees, you'll get hurt. If you look here, the trees are all photogrammetry. You might see that. And they do grow over time. Um, and then we come into camp and it's like there's a bit of cinematic in this. Um, so this one here is telling you there's a camp here. It's an abandoned camp. You've got to start the fire. So in a sense, um, I mentioned, uh, did I mention uh, my uncle was Michael Anderson who set up the 10 embassy in Canberra. So he always spoke about the sacred fire. So he's also, if you've seen him on ABC, he did a lot of stuff on Star Stories. Did you, anybody see that show or he see that one? It, it's, that stuff is, um, they were my stories actually. So he um, took them and he told, it, he told it better than me maybe. I wish I had a chance to tell it, but that's all right. We'll put it in here. This does go night and day. So those star, star stories, if I look, sorry, if I look up, they'll be at night, you'll see them in the sky. The stars will rotate. I think there's a word for it, which is just, I'm escaping me. If someone can give me that word, when the stars move through the sky in a certain oscillation around the, the North Pole, um, that's how the stars will move. The sun will also move across the sky in the same zenith, and then over summer to winter, it'll move basically how it should. Um, if you notice, this clouds should be moving. Um, this is not linked to the web, so we just got this generic one running. So when it gets online, it'll, it'll, the clouds will change to be what they are. Have I impressed you at all? Yes. Uh, we, we, let me just say, we don't know exactly what we're doing. Every day, my guys come in and, and we ask questions. We, we set a question down, like anything, and we don't know what the answers to the questions w will be or whether we can answer those questions. But we ask questions. I don't want to be sort of say, do this or do this or do this. Hey, what do you think we should do? What, what in your own heart, in your own culture, in your own connection to country do we do to make this better? And we iterate and iterate and iterate. We become agile. We do all that stuff, you know, all those words you want to use. We use those words uh, which are software development type and we get better. And that's the key here. Um, so I walk up to this one. I think I can look at that. That's probably a piece of firewood. I won't do the quest all up, but I'll, sh I'll just move that around and, yeah, there you go. It, it's metadata. So there's a piece of firewood. There's my hand. I've got to collect the firewood and eventually I've got to fill, feed that fire. Feed the fire, gather some warrigal greens, some bush food. Then um, after that we would uh, make a cutting stone. Um, take the cutting stone down, then our elder will turn up, he'll take it down to a canoe, and then we paddle that canoe down to the camp, down the, down the river. And that's generally the way this runs out. We've got other iterations we did for Sydney. We've done Botany Bay. We were going to work on the arrival of Captain Cook and show that ship coming down and, and start the life of a young Pemelwoy. Have you heard of Pemelwoy? Um, so Pemelwoy caused a bit of trouble. He burned a few flat, um, farms and threw a few spears and killed a few followers up there and they retaliated and sent his head back to England in a, in a vat of, um, of rum. Um, was it rum or was it cognac? I think it might have been cognac. Yeah, anyway, that's what they did and then of course they thought that would turn the followers away but they kept fighting for a few more decades after that. And of course um, that's a well documented piece of work by University of Newcastle on the frontier wars. So hence um, while I'm hanging around Newcastle doing Lake Macquarie as well. That's enough I want to say, and I'll sit back down there and see if this comes over and I can finish the talk. Can I just say that that is super, super cool? Like, yeah, I, I'm not even into games, but I actually want to want to have a go at that. I do have a question. You talked about there's you said there was 30 something quests in that particular one. There's a lot. So what, what's, the, what's the premise of it? So if you're, if you're, if you're playing, what's the intention? What, what are you supposed to achieve? Um, we're just saying we want to make a survival game, you know, a cultural survival game and try to survive as you can. If You'll find if you don't do the right things, um, you will die. But the other part of it is there's a, a respect for elders. So we want you to go to the camp and speak to elders in the camp. And then we've, there's a lot in this. I could tell you a lot about this, maybe an hour in terms of the features, one feature is that we're, we're doing a virtual genealogy for Aboriginal people in those areas as far back as we know. 
So I've, when I put people into a camp, there actually are the real people in those camps named as such. And that becomes a bit touchy too. So when I, when I did this in um, Wimmera, um, I had three biddies turn up at this uh, Federation University there at, um, around Horsham. And they were all, uh, and I had five screens you know, on the walls. And then they actually had their own little entourages work with them on the review of the project. Never talked to each other, but talked to their entourages and talked to me, each of them independently, which is quite flattering. And it's about that, about connecting those communities with their country and saying, is this worthwhile? The old people get it. We all think this is great for kids. No. Nah. Mm. No, I got, um, I'm a bit afraid, honestly. I'm afraid of what this means. And I'm scared. So I'm just going along and trying to be authentic and real, but ooh, I don't know what's, what I've opened up here in this stuff. Mm. Um, but we're trying to do authentic stuff and it's getting bigger than <laughs> we expected. Yeah. Ooh. Anyway, that's the truth of it. I think I, you sort of you know what I mean? What I also love about Virtual Songlines is that you've found a way to sort of merge your passion for video games um, with mm. stories and storytelling. Mm. Why was that important for you? I mean, what was the point at which you realised that actually um, this is something that I love doing, but this mm. might be a way of incorporating a way of introducing culture um, to generations that might not be aware or to even people that might not necessarily be Indigenous Australians and mm. raise that kind of awareness? I thought I'd sneak up on them. <laughs> 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 this is it. Um, I think... Um, I've been hunting and gathering for a solution for a while and this seemed to be the, the best way and I think, um, I think I call it a new technology for an ancient culture and I've got lots of other one-liners like that but um, it just seems to be, you know, if you passionately pursue something and be determined, uh, you'll get a solution and hopefully get other people engaged in this sort of space without really hitting them over the head with a, with a real nulla nulla, just a virtual one. Um, this is it. So that's the real purpose of that. Yeah. So I guess one of the things that I was thinking about in the lead up to this conversation was empathy, which you wonderfully um, defined for us at the beginning, Fincina. And I, I have to admit, when I think about my work, I, empathy is not necessarily the priority of what I'm trying to achieve. I'm kind of trying to get people to uh, think about things differently and have a different understanding um, and inform people, I guess, is what I'm hoping to achieve. Um, I wonder, do each of you consciously think about empathy in your practices? Is that something that is a priority? Um, I'll start with you, Fincina. Sure. Obviously you do, because that's the point of your <laughs> research. I mean, I think it's interesting that you talk about empathy not being necessarily something that's at the forefront of your, of your practice. I think we want to see empathy as a stepping stone to understanding and insight. And I really do think that that's why it's the key to reducing stigma about, you know, conditions such as living with a mental illness or, you know, opening up the floodgates of conversation around uh, difficult topics like suicide, for example. So I really do think that if we can use empathy's capacity to open up people's or to get over people's barriers or to overcome taboo in particular, I think that's really important. Um, so while my focus, obviously, in my research is on mental health, I'm just interested in what empathy can do. Um, and the extent to which empathy can lead to awareness raising, can lead to shared experiences, or can even lead to sharing of knowledge and insight. Um, so I don't think empathy in and of itself will necessarily produce social change, but I do think it, in some ways it is part of the stepping stone towards social change or in, you know, giving people insight into something they may not otherwise dare to think about. What about you, Amani? Is that something that you think about? Not really. I think I'm just suspicious of it because I think it's really... It, um, I'm sure it's something that you do, like you say. You know, it's something that people choose to do with you. And um, I'm also really cons uh, aware that when I make a game that I'm making just an object and it's, like, separate from me and, it's, and if I send it somewhere, it's... Uh, it's like disconnecting from how I put it together and, you know, it's, it, um, 
it's, uh, it's disconnecting from me and going to someone else. So it's not, I think it's important the way you, the way you take things from places, put it together and um, present it to the other person to see. So, and that in that meeting, that coming together and to recognize like, so if I send my game to someone who is in South Africa or somewhere and they have never met me and that I don't know how I'm connecting with them, you know, and I think it's like, I think it's really important to connect uh, person to person. Um, that's why I think, that, that's why I make games that you play together. So, I was almost yeah, like, and also sometimes yeah. it can be like an excuse, you know, okay, I empathize and maybe that's enough. I feel better because I can empathize Then maybe I don't do anymore. Um, and I think sometimes you can take other people's stories and uh, and kind of uh, appropriate yeah. it through empathy yeah. as well. So yeah, yeah. But I almost think that through your games, you are kind of triggering that response in people to, because you know, you're creating a level of intimacy that people generally wouldn't um, interact with in public. I mean, that magnet game was forcing, I'm assuming it's strangers in some instances. Some, yeah. They, yeah. I mean, so strangers in some instances to kind of be pretty intimate with each other, which is kind of forcing us, to, forcing them to break down those barriers that would ordinarily um, stop people from connecting. So I, I almost think that in, in su to some extent, your games do achieve a level of empathy. Putting um, people in situations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's one way of looking yeah. at it. Um, what about with you, Brett? Most definitely. I'm trying to get people to walk in the footsteps of my elders and my ancestors. So I want people to empathise with that. And uh, every one we do. On the 22nd of June, is that... No, what are we in, June? Yeah. yeah we <laughs> um, that's Friday, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're installing a VR exhibit in the um, uh, Lake Macquarie Gallery. And that will be allowing people to fly as Biraban, the wedge, uh, wedge tail eagle, over the lake, um, which is a dream time story of creation in that space. We want people to do that in VR and, and get an understanding of that. It could be told, it's narrated, it's in language, and um, we think that's important. That's one of our 38 projects that we're delivering in this, in this way. But generally what we're doing is doing them in... Um, in galleries, museums to start with. We're sneaking up on you all. <laughs> How do people respond to your virtual story, song lines every time you share them? Um, uh, let, let's just say, um, uh, look, I've done a lot of presentations on what was yesterday was Monday. I presented to VACO, which is the Victorian Aboriginal Community Health Organisations. And um, I was told there's some old ladies that weren't about the technology, so the, sh the place we're at was in Foy's Arcade, which is just in uh, Burke Street, and it's a very techo place for architects and for real estate people. But then when I showed our stuff, for, um, the one they showed up here, and I took them through the fire quest, um, people were really moved, and um, some of the old people to tears. So um, that's what it's about, I suppose, for my own people, and then hopefully other people will get the same um, respect and understanding. So it's about that. Um, mm. Yeah, There's another part of them that they wanted to see a way for us to connect our incarcerated um, brothers and sisters to connect back to country. Um, a loss of identity is a loss of self. And if we can do that, we can deal with a little bit of their mental anguish by giving them some play thing towards that. I'm not saying we can answer all their things, but I think there's just a small little thing we can contribute through this type of work. Mm. And just speaking of virtual reality, um, the late film reviewer, Roger Ebert, sort of described cinema as the ultimate empathy machine. And um, recent, in recent years, um, Chris Milk, a filmmaker at a TED Talk, said VR is the ultimate empathy machine. And I guess my question to the three of you is, is it the technology that you think is the empathy machine or the story itself? 
Fincina, I'll let you... I'll go first. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's always about storytelling. Um, because at the end of the day, if we think of empathy as an imaginative act, one of the ways in which we tap into our imaginative potential is through stories, through sharing of stories, through listening to stories. So in many ways, I see VR or cinema or indeed any other form of art as almost the, the medium, <laughs> you know, the old thing, the message in the medium. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned that um, idea of cinema as empathy machine and then virtual reality as empathy machine. Uh, for anyone who's interested in these debates, there's a fabulous, fabulous article in Senses of Cinema, the online film journal, uh, which I had the pleasure of working on some years ago. But this recent article published last year by Cy Mitchell is interrogating this very issue of is VR the empathy machine that it's being acclaimed to be? And it's such a fantastic piece because it really does interrogate some of the debates that are currently happening in the VR community about is it an empathy machine or is it actually more about interactivity and is it not so much about empathising with another person but placing yourself in the situation and then learning about yourself and your responses. So there's a bit of nuance that's coming into the discussion around empathy and they also talk about the fact that VR is not filmmaking as well and they're very clear about that distinction there. Um, so but it's filmmakers do use VR though. They do, I know. I find mm. that really interesting and I think this is where some of the debates are happening in the community right now is um, because VR is still in that very much that early developmental phase where they're trying new technologies and developing new vocabularies, the question is, is our template cinema or is it something different? Mm. And there's even been people suggesting it's actually more about theatre and performativity and interactivity in that space. So um, for people who want to read more about it, I found it such a great piece. It's by Cy Mitchell in Senses of Cinema and it really does tap into all of these ethical debates around empathy and what are the potentials and the limitations of the technology for that. Mm -hmm. And Brett, you work as VR. Um, you know, do you think it's the technology itself that, that is the empathy machine or the story? Story is king. Story is king. Um, the stories are old. The stories have always been there. Story is king. And... Um, we're grappling with how to tell that continuous story, one that never never ends. And, uh, I mean, the, the perfect example of that is the Seven Sisters yarn. And if anybody's been to the National Museum of Australia, there's a really good display on there. And everybody would see that story and have, like, a, a half-hour experience. But that yarn's a long story. And it travels from South Australia all the way up to Arnhem Land. Now, if you want to tell the story properly, it's that distance. So you see what I mean by, you know, stories like that? So how do you, and that's what we're grappling with, how do you respectfully tell that yarn when it's such a long story that's connected and shared and, and told by so many different groups from that length and breadth of the country? And if you're careful enough, you can see it in the stars if you know it. So it goes further and, f and onwards. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... Story, it's story which is key. Now, I'm just, uh, I've been around media for a while, so I've been a bit in print, been a bit in radio, been a bit in TV, and now moving on to the next phase, I think it's just, uh, it's still about storytelling all the way along. So, yeah, conversations like we're having today. Hmm. What about you, Amani? What do you think? Um, what is the empathy machine? Yeah, is it the technology itself or is it the story? Um, I, uh, it, it's a really hard question for me. I, I just don't think that there can be a machine that's empathy, like a, a machine. Mm. Um, um, it, I, I, don't, I don't think it's in an object. Yeah. Yeah. So what about with experiences like VR, for example, that... Um, unlike anything we've ever experienced before, can quite literally take you into experiences of other people. I mean, um, a lot of not-for-profits and journalists, you know, make these films that, that um, allow you to experience life in a Syrian refugee camp, uh, in, in Syria, for example, as the war's happening, or in a refugee camp, or to experience what it's like being homeless. And many people have sort of said that um, after experiencing those sorts of films, they've felt moved in a way that they haven't before because they can experience it and they can feel like they're there. Um, what do you think about that sort of component that VR is able to do that um, in a way that no other medium has ever been able to do that before? Oh, so much to say about that. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll just say 
we've got a, a thing with, I, I've showed you virtual Ruby arms. What we want to move people to do, what we want to empower people to do is to deal with their river, not to pollute it. What we did, um, and I can go back to so many rivers, the Cooks River that flows in the Botany Bay was a cesspool, but it was the first water source, the fresh water source for the first settlers. Then it got bastardised. And I think there's a big move towards doing better about our waterways uh, that we never used to do. Um, cleaning up Australia tends to focus around the rivers, if you've seen that program. Now, I'm just saying when we do something about the river for virtual river yarns or for Cooks River or for the Brisbane River, Maywa or whatever, we want people to respect that river. And then from an Indigenous perspective, we name it. We name it for its utility for First Nations people. And that utility has been there since time immemorial. If you've heard of the word Parramatta, anyone knows Parramatta River? Do you know what its Aboriginal meaning is? No. It's a place of eels. It's a bloody good feed for eels. <laughs> That's where you go to get eels. So respecting that and not polluting the, that river means that you've got a good feed for a long time. And we can just debate water purity around the world. But I hope that using a bit of technology is just a tool for that, to get people to not empathise just to feel, mm. but empathy for action. Mm. That's the key in all this stuff. And I hope that if I can sneak up on Aboriginal kids, mm. then they'll get out and do something in country and walk on country and walk in the footsteps of their elders as they had since time immemorial. Bingo. I think that's absolutely key. Uh, empathy leading to action is one of the concerns that's being registered around the space, around using VR technology for NGOs and those sorts of uh, that sector. There's a concern that there's a degree of, uh, I guess, voyeurism, mm. um, cultural tourism as it's described, mm. and having these sorts of interactive experiences based in a refugee camp, for example. There's also a lot of debate around the fact that uh, empathy, you know, a true feeling of empathy isn't always going to be, and quite often, not pleasant. Mm. Um, and therefore, if you have an overwhelming emotional response to a traumatic experience, that will not lead to action or that will not lead to any social change. So I think, um, it's, I think in some respects, NGOs have been very quick to jump on the VR bandwagon because it's a way of, I guess, you're always competing with other NGOs for getting your message out there or getting people to engage so do you with think things. But it has a flip side that it can be all about the novelty. Yeah, of, I was about to say, yeah. It's, it's gamification, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's what makes me a bit uncomfortable about it. In some respects, it's gamification of real-world problems. And I'm thinking, will this actually lead to action or social change or is it more about becoming overwhelmed with a negative emotional affect. Yeah, because one of the things that I was thinking about was, say for example, you're having this VR experience that's mm -hmm. taking you inside Syria at the moment and the bombings going around and all that sort of stuff. And I almost wonder, you know, yes, I would probably have an emotional connection to being there in real time, mm -hmm. but I also don't carry with me the anxieties and the fears that Syrians have that are in that situation. And I don't quite know how that alters my experience of their reality. Um, and I don't know if that's something that, I don't work in VR, but I, I was wondering, is this something that you think about? Brett? I think yeah, Amani? I think you have to really make an effort to like n know how, how you're connecting with, with those people that you're seeing. Mm. You know, it, that's why I think that, you know, if you want to, it, it requires more work uh, rather than just watching something. Mm. Yeah, can I just add to that too? I think one of the things that helps to perhaps give greater context to these sorts of virtual reality experiences is when there's narration and when there's, there's sound and voice. Um, it doesn't have to be one person's story per se, but it's a way of communicating the socio-political cultural context of that interactive experience um, that I think is really crucial for embedding the emotional experience in some kind of knowledge. Um, so it's interesting to read about the role of sound in creating a sense of virtual reality. I mean, looking before at your virtual reality experience, I was really struck by how important sound was. To We didn't hear it before because you were talking, but when we were looking at it earlier, yeah. sound was absolutely key for me. We use um, ambisonic um, sound in our work, mm. and uh, one of the ambisonic means is how your ears hear and how sound attenuates over distance. So that's in the, our work, but um, one of the things we've done in... Um, Lake Macquarie is we've got a shark in it.
that actually if you fall off your canoe or your Nawi, Nawi Aboriginal word, uh, the shark comes and has a munch on you. And that freaks people out. And uh, we were told to take it out because it, it, it evoked too much of an emotional response. Too much empathy. <laughs> too much empathy. Well, they couldn't swim fast enough. <laughs> yeah, I just told them they'd just swim faster than their friend. <laughs> But the thing is that, um, um, on a serious note, we, we had one criticism from one lady who felt the water was too real. And I said, and she didn't want us to have the water so real. And I'm going, mm. but, so we worked really hard on the water. Mm. And she said, oh, well, but I'm afraid of water. Mm. Um, and I don't like to swim, so I don't swim. And uh, so we're going, well, that, I don't know whether to take that as a criticism or a win, <laughs> but... Um, so we had that debate about changing the water, the textures and the aspects of it. In effect, um, people's fears can be uh, personified in virtual reality and you've got to be mindful of that. Mm. So there's lots of study here and mm. like everybody says it's new VR. I've been in VR since the 90s. Uh, I was at the first wave, so I didn't really know. And trust me, you don't know. Everybody says it's the first wave, the second wave, whatever. I don't really care about whether what wave it is um, as long as the wave's not too big mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that you're just trying to do something that connects with people and there's a lot of good VR people that are doing some amazingly great work that I'm inspired by and uh, not the ones that are trying to make a buck from it mm -hmm. um, and there's trust me there's I see a lot of the people like that um, and I, I'm hoping that customers or users or the community that experience these will be able to discern that and hopefully in that discerning, you'll get an empathy. I don't, it sounds like, I, I, I don't mean to say, it sounds like we're really on topic, but I'm just saying mm. that's from the heart, that's what we're trying mm. to achieve. Yeah. And I hope you can feel that and hear that. Yeah. Speaking of ethical considerations, I guess I'm fascinated specifically with you, Brett, and your work and the thinking that goes into the song lines that you choose to tell digitally. And I was sort of thinking, how do you navigate issues like, you know, with sacred sites, for example? You know, what's the conversation there? I mean, do you go into community? Do you ask, like, what, what sort of considerations are made when you are approaching these sorts of projects? I think it's like, with it, it's not easy. I've got um, many, many messages all the time about, um, from people who we're dealing with. Um, th there's a whole debate about cultural protocol with regard to speaking on country that I'm dealing with at the moment here in a project with the Mooloola, Mooloola River, which is just at Sippy Downs up on the Sunshine Coast. And there's a lovely lady called Bridget, uh, Bridget um, Chili Davis, who's from that, who speaks passionately about looking at old photographs and seeing her elders, like literally giving me a message at 10 o'clock at night and saying, I'm seeing the spirits of my ancestors. And, and I've done a project for her for just free. You know, we, it would have cost us 60,000 bucks, but we just gave her a solution with our toolkit. And it, it moves her to tears, and, 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 and she uses it for her cultural inductions for all the government departments because she's really concerned about the lack of attention and care for her country, which she believes her grandmother was there since whenever. Now, um, that... Then, in one moment, she's really, really supportive. The next minute, she's abusing me with all manner of language in the world at, at really difficult times at night. It's not, she's not angry at me. She's angry at everybody around her, and, and I've got this obligation to help her solve that problem. And don't get me wrong, this is happening in lots of land councils that I deal with all over the shop, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen in Wimmera when we officially launch it at the town hall, uh, the town hall where Aboriginal people were hung um, um, it, time gone by and elders have kept that story alive. So there's stuff in this um, that you've got to just deal with. And I won't go into Sydney or Perth. I had a teleconference with Perth today about Wajak and they wanted to do the Yagan story, which if you know mm. Yagan was a freedom fighter over there, mm. and, um, and, and do a story about his... But not do the story about his fighting at the time, but more about his life up to the time that the boat came in. I don't know the name of the boat, um, but when it first comes into the Swan River and lays anchor, that'll be the end of the project because um, we want to get that story right. Yagan could have been told at Yagan Square, but the community pulled it. And so they think that this VR stuff 
is a solution to that and giving people maybe six chapters and um, addressing it that way. So I'm trying to say that there's protocol all the way across the country that we're dealing and I've got to make sure my team's aware of that and mindful of that and empathetic to that um, as we carefully uh, construct our virtual environments mm. authentically. Can I ask something? Yeah. Um, I was... I, 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 uh, I'm just trying to get an idea of what you're giving to the the lady. Um, just a, a virtual environment with her, um, with um, Bridget. Um, we've we work with her on a cultural heritage map. We've done a 2D map, and then um, worked with her to put in where her sites were, and uh, where her campsites were. Architecture, uh, sort of archaeologically correct, where the fire place was found. Then we've done her tracks. There was um, a number. There's a number of water holes are off the Mulder River where the water tastes different mm -hmm. because of the plants that are there. So yeah. she says she's got three different flavours of spring water, yeah. or four, I should say. And um, so we're thinking that's great. And so these are little stories or anecdotes we're trying to recreate in 3D or VR. And then she presents that world, and she speaks people through that country over. 35, 40 minutes, and then people feel like they're walking country. Then after that, she takes them there and walks them on there. So we, we blend the two. So it's never just the machine alone. It's the machine uh, simulating the landscape and then making people walk, and she makes them take their shoes off and walk on country. And uh, that's good. She introduces them to frogs, and we've got frogs in the world, to the the, the birds over the sky and the and the the moving grasses and bush foods and then she feeds them a bit and that's the story and then people come away quite emotionally charged from that and hopefully spiritually enriched yeah. and uh, we love that and that's why we do it. Yeah. And Amani, is that a consideration with your um, games in terms of um, ethics? You talked about how when you went to the Maldives you had to really think about the safety of, of, of the people as you were um, yeah. re make, you know, setting up these games. Um, but what other considerations do you have to make um, in the process of creating your games? Um, it, uh, it depends a lot on where, um, who is going to play it and who I'm making things for. Um, of course, in the, in, in the Maldives, we didn't play Magnetize Me because a few months before that, the Islamic ministry had, um, had just circulated a letter, not, th not something legal, but circulated a letter saying that women and men shouldn't be dancing together. Right. So we didn't run Magnetize Me because we didn't want to put people into those positions where they could get into trouble. Um, and we actually did run a game by Victor Beto, um, which was about chasing each other on the streets. And that could have been that that could have been dangerous, but it was it turned out to be one of the things that people really enjoyed because it was kind of um, you were playing that you were one of the teams was um, police, and then the other team was some terrorists, yeah. um, but. People had been used to running away from the police because of demonstrations and uh, things like that. So it was like a way of doing it in a playful way right. and in the streets. So it was one of the things that people really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, although that could have put them in danger as well. Right. So it was always a negotiating, um, you know, and really trying to figure out together with the people who are playing with you. Right. Like what is... Similar. Yeah. Like a training simulator. Well. Yeah. I, I actually, yeah. I actually should open yeah. the floor to questions from the audience because um, I think, yeah, we could keep <laughs> talking, yeah. but, I, but I, I just want to um, give the audience an opportunity to ask you guys a question. So if you've got a question, just put your hand up and someone will come to you with a mic. Um, um, thank you very much for all those presentations. Uh, Really takes, you can take quite a lot from that. My question comes from the idea of intention and a call to action 
and kind of what you were saying, Brett and Armani, around, you know, if there is no change, then it potentially sits in this voyeuristic sort of place where I get to feel better because I've sat there and thought about it, but I've never actually had to change myself. So I think maybe there's like two levels where it's like, you know, especially with your work, Brett, where we, especially if I was, for example, to play that, I as a colonizer slash settler am walking in those footsteps without necessarily, you know, if I wasn't conscious enough to reflect of how, uh, how my present day I do that. And so how, how do you shift it to make sure people reflect to how they perpetrate or are connected to the oppression? Even in the Syria example, you know, we live in a globalised world where we all, be it through capitalism, consumerism, the, who we vote for, where we show up to, where we don't show up to, we, you know, have an effect or a, a, a hand in that. And then secondly, it's how do you measure and this is very corporate-y, but how do you measure success? So how do you know that you've actually created change? Yeah. For me? Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, measuring, let me come to the second part first. Um, I'm hoping that um, we take some feedback from that and people have got the time to, um, to tell us and give us feedback to what we do. So. We're trying to get a virtual world where people register, in a sense, to be in it and not give a whole lot of detail, but enough to us to say, this is my name and this is where I'm from. So if you notice our work, it's all regionally specific. So we make it topographically correct So uh, for the places we're doing. So we're building a, basically a virtual jigsaw puzzle and one piece at a time we're going to connect them all up. We hope that you can walk from Bris Brisbane to Perth eventually. That's going to be a big ask, but we might make you a bird for part of it so you don't have to walk so far. <laughs> but the thing is we want people to connect in there. So we're working towards a multi-user world. And in that, we want to have conversation. So I think your feedback or the feedback or the empathy or that yarn, we want to see that between people in a community. And uh, I can get into the theory of games in multi-user that talk about that community that goes on. And lots of people are trying to elicit that and, um, and then tag on to um, those things that make us addicted to a thing, like those little click and win things. And you <laughs> see those games that really aren't important. We want to go beyond that, transcend that, and get into a real emotional uh, connection to the land and reflect on that. And in effect, we're trying to look at that romantic view that many Indigenous people have too. So I think that's sort of partially answering yours. Um, and, but we're still trying. Don't, don't think that we've got the answers. We're, we're trying to uh, research and develop, I suppose, to be really corporate. Um, but we're getting there. And we just iterate, see, see if that works, and then iterate again and iterate and iterate, and hopefully we'll get there. Um, but I'm not saying we're there yet. But with regard to VR, I don't think there's a whole lot of them doing it well yet. I think there's a couple that are trying to get... I mean, we can count them on one hand, can't we? VR ones are really working, but a lot of them are trying to make a buck. And that's what really bothers me. Not saying that's a bad thing, but I, I think we've, we've got serious games, especially in VR, have a place. And, and I think if I say that word to you, you'll eventually learn that there's more coming up and more going on, especially through the simulation um, industry. Um, and, um, and in the serious simulation industry too, Great. like construction. Mm -hmm. We have another question at the back. Uh, yes, I'd just like to build on that question. And uh, Brett, you used some words before about we want people to know their river. And I'm sort of thinking about we all bring our river into an equation. And if empathy is something that you evoke, how do we know when or how that changes us and what our call to action is? And that's why people read and engage with the world. So I don't know whether the call to action is something we can't always pinpoint, but I think it's something about the river that someone brings to the, the machine. Can I just speak to that? Yeah, I think one of the uh, challenges for anyone talking about or researching empathy is that it is a, an exchange. 
It isn't just the viewer in the shoes of the character or in, the, in that position of the game. Because every viewer has, as you say, their own river or their own backstory that they bring to that, and that shapes their empathetic engagement. And I think it's really interesting to think about the fact that empathy is a dynamic thing that can't necessarily be pinned down, can't necessarily be measured. Um, so places like Art with Impact, what they try and do is they try and measure, to come to the question of measuring, the, the impact of their programs through the conversations they have afterwards. And that's really important. And I think it's not a quantitative measure, but a qualitative measure of change, change in attitudes, change in mind. Uh, but also it's about connecting the viewer to a whole network of resources and community around man mental health. And there's one other thing I wanted to mention too about safety and ethics and this question of, you know, whatever screen technology you're using, whether it be virtual reality or games or digital storytelling, ensuring that the people participating in that screen technology feel safe and protected. So when it comes to telling stories about mental health, whether that be you being part of a forum, a discussion around mental health, or whether that be you actually picking up a camera and telling your own story, it's really important that that conversation is safe and guided and supported. And I think that's one of the ethical obligations that people like Art with Impact really do a great job of, is making sure that anyone telling screen stories about mental health feel safe and feel protected and have those ethical guidelines in place. So it's really important to, to mention that it isn't just, hey, let's just talk about this. It's, it's got to be a guided, protected, safe discussion. Mm. Do you have any more questions? Um, Brett, I just wanted to pick up on the first question, um, this idea of voyeurism and um, and I'm wondering what responsibility rests with the viewer um, going into these experiences? I mean, yes, you know, the, the, the people that are developing these experiences have to make all these considerations. But when you are entering someone else's lived experience, surely there has to be some responsibility um, for actually going on that, on that journey of someone else's life, really. I mean, the viewer cannot be absolutely removed from that responsibility, or can they? Can I, can I answer that through the, the way that we deal with each project we do, we do it with the community. And um, so we have, um, each one of those is an Indigenous group that advises us, in a sense an advisory group. And they're very concerned about how this works. And so I'm constantly educating them about the potential, and we're carefully, carefully dealing with that. But with the user that's in this space, it's really that the community's sense of place and connection and their own cultural heritage needs to then be shared uh, to others so that people have a greater understanding. So that generally becomes a premise as to why we do it. And so, and so we're careful about always going back and getting that right and following a process for that and a protocol. And it's the debate, sometimes an argument. Um, and, and that's always something you've got to take on board. There's a huge responsibility with what we do. And, uh, and, and sometimes my own team don't realise that when I tell them, to, don't forget who this audience is, don't forget who you're serving, don't forget the responsibility you've got in terms of getting this right and not missing out or making sure the edges are correct. Mm. This is all so important. So, and we're just getting better all the time. So we. We don't think we've done our best work yet. I don't think we'll get there in the next decade either. But we are working towards that, that level of perfection, which you never attain, but you've got to do it for the people that you're looking to influence, I suppose, how to win friends and influence people, I suppose, in this regard. Do you have any questions? Um, so I guess I will ask the last question. Um, and I want to know what the ultimate empathy machine is, is for each of you. I think books are the ultimate empathy machine for me because that's just where I get the strongest connection and understanding of other people's experiences and lives. But I would be interested to know what you all think. Francina? Well, I'm going to be predisposed to say screen because that's my passion. But I think one of the reasons why, you know, in the 20th century they said cinema was the ultimate art form was because it brought together all these other art forms. It brought together storytelling, narration, it brought together music, it brought together architecture and art and visual representation, etc. So for me, I think one of the things I'm still very interested in with screen stories and it extends to virtual reality is the fact that you've got multiple forms of storytelling. You've got the use of sound, sound effects, you've got the use of music, you've got the use of imagery. Um, and all of those elements can be deployed in different ways. So for me, it's the total package 
so <laughs> I'm always going to come back to cinema and TV, but that's just me. Uh, but I do think that all art in different ways is an empathy machine. Good answer. Amani? Uh, I think I also like books. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I like, yeah. I, I'll just say that because Oops. I don't think it's, I don't really go for empathy, so I, don't, I would just want people to do things. Yeah. Yeah. Brent? Um, First Nations people ever read books. We maybe did a bit of rock art. I want to build the holodeck. Who wants, who's this Trekkie here? <laughs> <laughs> the holodeck. Yeah. That'll work. Yeah. And um, I think we can do it. I really believe we can do it. I think we want to be, I think the holodeck can make a time machine. That's what I want. I reckon that'll work. I think we're getting there. I'm totally convinced. <laughs> well, uh, on that note, um, <laughs> that is the end of tonight's panel. So if you could all join me in thanking Brett Levy, Amani Nassim and Fincina Hopgood. <laughs> <laughs>